Right, that will do. Hello everyone, I'm Asteria. I make videos about fashion, from high fashion to alternative to everything in between. This video was born of my own seasonal desire to celebrate the darker aspect of the world and naturally this impacts my creativity, hence the theme of this video. Witchy aesthetics have been popular for a while now, being seen in the forms of witch core, whimsy goth, pagan goth and to some extent goblin and fairy core and with the beginning of fall it's only going to be more present. We are at an interesting time in history where people use trends to express their deepest desires and fantasies, their values and beliefs. Fashion has never only been reduced to a matter of which color of fabric one prefers. It has always had meaning. It's a mean of communication between individuals and communities. Aesthetic always have a context and there is a web of reason as to why they become popular at a certain time. I'm going to take you on a journey through the different representations of the witch through the ages, going pretty far back until we reach the present day, from history to pop culture. It seems the witchy girls are everywhere, but how new is that? Disclaimer that although I'm going to talk about witchcraft, I'm not here to judge people about their practice and spiritualities. People finding meaning and a path for themselves should be respected, of course as long as they don't become a religious fundamentalist that imposes their view on others. Another disclaimer is that I'm going to focus mostly on cis women, but that doesn't mean that this aesthetic or witchcraft is close to other genders. Anyone can embrace any aesthetic however they want. One could even say there's an inherent magic to bending the rules of gender norms. That said, I hope you enjoyed this video. I wanted to start this journey with the ancient Greek goddess Hecate, because she had such a big impact on how the concept of the witch was shaped. Many elements we found associated with the present witch found their way in the way she is and was depicted. Hecate is most commonly known as the goddess of witches, but like many other gods reduced to a few archetypes, her domains are far more complex than that. Her image evolved during the centuries, the notable turning point being a numerous apparitions in the Greek magical papyri in the Hellenistic era, and the many cursed tablets we found calling her name. However, the way we view her in the modern time is due to a depiction by the occultist Aleister Crowley in the late Victorian era, as well as by Wiccan influences. I'll go back to that later, since many things happened before that. In ancient time, Ekate was known to have dominions over ghosts, as she was said to have the power to send the dead onto the living, to haunt them even in their waking hours, and force heaven to unfold following the will of the one who called. In the book Restless Dead by Sarah Alice Johnson, she says, It was the dominion of our restless souls that led to Hecate's familiar role as magician's goddess as well, for control of a soul was essential to most ancient magical procedures. So here we see the first seed of why witches have a dark aesthetic surrounding them. It is this connection to death and curses, this ability to break the barrier between the waking world and the one beyond opening a window between them. It highlights the idea of a taboo and the fear of the unknown. However, she is also the keeper of the keys, the guardian of boundaries, the one who watches over liminal spaces and entrances. She had the role of protecting cities and homes and was worshipped as a household deity. About liminal spaces, this strengthened the connection to witches as magic happened in that space of in-betweens. Three-headed statues were often found at crossroads, another type of liminal space, looking at each direction, granting protection to travelers, which is perhaps the origin of the idea that one can meet the devil at the crossroads. Due to later Christian influences and misunderstanding of chthonic deities, especially if they are feminine, and it will feed the fantasy of the witch in the millennia to come. Another key element to understand how she shaped the idea of the witch in the West is how she is seen as a teacher of the magical arts. Historically, she was seen as a goddess who took care of the young, protect them, help them grow, and help them cross from childhood to adulthood, which at that time meant until you got married. In myth, she also had a priestess called Medea, granddaughter of the sun god Helios. She was a legendary witch of terrible power who drew down the moon itself, which was a poetic way of saying she could reverse the natural order of things. She helped the hero Yasun, but also killed her own children. It's a cue to tell us that yes, Hecate was connected to witches, as she was her priestess, but also that the view of witches was a pretty negative. However, not all type of magic was considered bad, since oracles, seers, healers and hierophants were all connected to the mystic realms, 
but it was the domain of the sacred, not necromancy, so seen through a religious lens. Also, much like Artemis, Hecate was given offerings and prayed to to help women in childbirth, which again is a trait shared by witches who were said to possess special knowledge in order to help people in time of danger, and giving birth was and still is a time of great danger for the body. Now to the visual elements. We often associate witches with cats, yet it is with hounds she was most often paired. Like Artemis, whom she shared many traits with, above all her connection to the moon, this mystical asteroid sung by poets since the dawn of time. She was also connected to serpents, torches, daggers and keys. All these elements fed the witch aesthetic and can be found in later representations. Amulets or engraved stones were often made with their image as apotropaic symbols, which mean they protected from evil influences. We jump a bit through time to reach the Middle Age and the infamous witch hunt. At this point in time, seemingly forgotten are the old gods, yet tales have carried through times and the witches of old still live in the collective imagination. The spread of printing in the West in the 1400s saw the proliferation of imageries of witches and demons, which fed the collective consciousness of the people with dread for these worrying witches who they were told were casting their shadow onto the world. The state religion had a strong incentive to control the population by putting fear into their hearts, and it didn't matter if innocent people were harmed in the process. This created a perfect environment for wide-scale superstition to grow, you can probably call it mass hysteria. It was a time of obscurantism, where famines, plagues and wars took so many lives in the population. People were looking for a reason for these events, and the witches, seen as the proof of the presence of the devil on earth, we are satisfying explanation to that. 1486, the Malleus Maleficarum was printed and soon it spread everywhere. It was used by those who led witches' trials in order to give them the guidelines to, to identify them. Of course, it mostly but not exclusively targeted women and the so-called laws they followed to identify witches were extremely blurry. So once you got accused, it was almost impossible to prove your innocence and they would torture you until you admitted in the hope to be released in death. Their supposed power and nefarious activities varied from place to place, and the, each country had its own superstitions. For example, in Switzerland, where I was born and where I currently live, which is also the place where the last European witch was burned in freaking 782, there were things you could do to protect yourself from witches. For example, in order to cancel a curse or reflect back the evil eye, one could use pine trees, which are plentiful here, to hang some by your door and have it cut like a hand. Now let's look at these engravings. What did a witch look like back then? Keep in mind that these images are fantasies, but they had such a powerful impact on our collective imagination that it impacted a later work of fiction as well as fashion. This illustration shows an old woman with unattractive features, unruly hair, which wasn't common back then, as a woman of height morality wore something on her head, naked, which obviously for these people is shameful, with fingers like claws and a Mephistophelian smile. But yeah, here is why in witchy style the hair is often long and free, or else it's somewhat on the center of attention, using colors or an unusual haircut. It signifies a wild soul and long hair have a long connection of to mystical power in the European vision. You will notice in these images that the witches are represented as old and ugly. That's because being beautiful was seen as a mark of high morality and purity. So a witch who sells her soul to Satan had to be old and ugly. This idea still exists to this day since many witches are represented as whole hags in pop culture. But not all of them. But we'll see later what changed that. Spoiler, it's not positive at all. There's also the flight, which seems to be an idea that arose at this time and that we can still find today. They would use a broom, a stick or a flying ointment or fly riding a beast like a goat. There is even an extract in the Malleus Maleficarum where they are said to have Diana as a consort, which is a Roman goddess of the wilderness, the hunt and the moon, which shows how they di diabolized all their religious belief. The nudity was also an important part, as up until the Renaissance, it was taboo to represent it, so it was meant to repulse as much as possible and to evoke shame. This one, for example, shows witches flying on a stick with animal heads, showing the belief they could shapeshift, but also a way to show their bestiality, their condition lower than man, since Looking at Christian scriptures is the creation of God on which the rest of the creation gravitates. This one shows one of those sabbats where the witch seems to be performing magical acts in front of demons. 
It illustrates the idea of a Sabbath of witches, a gathering where they would all come in the dead of night to indulge themselves in degrading acts during which they will cast spells to harm the community. However, at this time, you will notice that their clothes are not as witchy as you could imagine. They have some symbols, for sure, but not the look. They are dressed as regular women for the most part, maybe if we exclude the hair. At a time when society kept advancing technologically, people felt a need to go back to nature, to appreciate its beauty and art was made to reflect that. There was also a big push to rediscover and reinterpret old tales and legends and adapt them to their taste. Therefore, the witch saw a new transformation to her image. Gone were the days where witch was just a woman people wanted gone. Now the witch is a solitary woman who lives in the wood with her black cat. Sometimes she's a good-hearted woman who helps those in needs, although she is rather called a fairy in those cases, and sometimes She's an infernal being who eats children. The pre raphaelite and symbolist of the late 19th century rediscovered these tales, myths and legends and were seized with fascination which motivated them to create amazing art. To be fair, as much as I enjoy this part of art history for its capacity to excite my imagination and sense of wonder, I cannot help but notice how misogynistic it was. A big thing that changed is that the witch wasn't an old hag anymore. She was sexy. Of course, there were subtle examples of crones taken from folk story, such as these paintings show. The witch has an ominous cauldron, white tangled hair, and a dark hood, which signify that she is hiding her true motives. She is basically a trap in the middle of the forest, far away from the watchful eye of civilization. But yeah, basically, women were either depicted as delicate and pure flower what could, that could do no harm, but that one had to be careful not to step on, or as femme fatale. I'm gonna focus on the latter because it's connected to the theme of the witch. The goal of the femme fatale was only, and only, to seduce men and call their end, be it moral or very literal. They are the most beautiful, seductive and tempting, the most dreadful for the power they had on men to the point of bending their will or distract them for their work and family. So here we see how witches are connected to the femme fatale, however they sort of are a subcategory of it. They are powerful, beautiful, and have the means to destroy, to the point of being some type of nefarious magic that will morally ruin man. There is also a strong link to the loss of virility, which comes from the Middle Age and Roman era. Finally, with the rise of Christianity, beauty, when it follows strict guidelines, is seen as a make mark of moral purity, or, on the contrary, as a mark of evil when it's in the wrong soul. As it was said that Lucifer was the most beautiful of all angels, and as we can see with the femme fatale. A few examples I can give you are Kirky, Medea, and Morgan Le Fay. All of them were painted by the greatest artist of all time, and long is gone the medieval representation of the witch. As you can see, their outfits are long, sophisticated, and full of layers, but also something that made them beautiful and attractive in the eyes of men. I think we can see here the modern witchy love for drapes, scarves, and long flowy skirts, as well as plenty of jewelry, to really make the look richer and seductive. They don't wear only black, but rich colors and motifs. They have this powerful aura and really show how idealized these women were in the eyes of the artists depicting them, and how different from common women they were. So how do, did we get to the witchy girl of today? Now I'm not gonna get too much into occult history, because that would be too much to handle, but it is sort of a continuation of the romanticization of the witch, plus a time when female empowerment was growing, so the figure became important and was reclaimed spiritually. It started leaving fiction to become something a lot more people practiced. The Victorian era saw the boom of the practice of spiritism during the 1850s, popularized by authors like Allan Kardec. The practitioners aimed at contacting the dead during their gatherings. This is how we got Ouija boards, which are still part of the witchcore aesthetic, even though they have nothing to do with witchcraft to begin with. To that we can add pendulums and tarot cards, still part of the kit of modern witches, whether it be in fictions or not. They had a deep fascination for anything paranormal and a relationship with death that is strikingly different from our own. Spiritism is a part of what influenced modern New Age spiritual currents, alongside the theosophy of Madame Blavatsky, which mixed astrology, Jewish mysticism, and Eastern philosophy in what we will be known as the roots of New Age spiritualities. I previously mentioned how the occultist Aleister Crowley influenced modern conception of Hecate and thus of witches. He popularized the, the idea of Hecate as a crone in his novel Moonchild, published in 1929, in which he writes, and thirdly, she is Hecate, 
I think altogether hell, hideous and malicious, the queen of death and evil witchcraft. Hecate is the crone, the woman past all hope on motherhood, her soul black with envy and hatred of, of happier mortals. Yikes. So yeah, you can see how folkloric depiction of witches influenced the way um, this occultist saw Hecate, that and his shameless misogyny. Another big influence came around a bit later. Wicca was founded by Gerald Gardner and has its roots in northern western paganism, but also in the occultism movement on the first half of the 20th century, and it became known in the public in 1954. It distanced itself from the devil association to turn towards goddesses in a move that was meant to embrace nature and the feminine aspect of the universe, but also to empower women. Male deities are also honored, but they are in a balanced way with the feminine. I'm not gonna get too much into details because I've been told there are many different types of Wicca and I'm not one so I can't really talk much about it. Some Wiccans are monotheist, some are pantheist and some are polytheist. However, today even some witches who aren't Wiccan practice the Sabbath and Esbat, also called the Wheel of the Year. So you can't really deny his impact even though there has been a recent push towards more traditional, reconstructionist and local folkloric practices. Therefore, I'm just gonna focus on what Wicca did to influence the witchy aesthetic because it has been very popular for a while and not too long ago, it was the entry point to anyone interested in witchcraft even though it's only one way to approach it. You might have seen these pentagrams everywhere, from house decoration to jewelry to patterns on clothes. It actually comes from various places of the ancient world since it's a simple shape to draw geometrically, and back then, geometry in the divine had a strong link. It appeared again in the Middle Age in the poem of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and it was later appropriated by Hermeticism, and that's when the distinction of whether it pointed upward or downward appeared. There are also many incredible pictures from the early 19th century that really capture the otherworldliness of the witch, being it in a celestial way, or playing with bohemian, aesthetic of a fortune teller, or showcasing pure hermetic imagery. It started a tradition of using photography in an artistic way to create a story with characters. These pictures are so old, but I found them so modern at the same time, especially when you compare them to modern fantasy photo shoots of women doing the exact same thing. It shows that people, even back then, had a deep desire to immerse themselves in stories and let themselves dream freely. were invented, witches naturally became a villain and alongside the vampires became horror character of choice. At best, they are morally great characters. One movie that embraced the femme fatale aspect of the witch more though is La Maschera del Demonio by Mario Bava in 1960. It starts with the witch hunters inquisitors marking a witch with red iron and banishing her to hell and putting on her a nailed max mask to trap her forever. Before being bound to the mask and placed in the crypt of her ancestors, she curses him in typical fashion and swears to return. When the witch escapes, a young woman who looks identical to the witch is seen in the graveyard with a long black cape, an intact face and two massive black hounds. Black animals have an especially strong connection to witchcraft because the color black is perceived as evil, as seen in the folklore of many countries. I cannot not see how strikingly Ekatean she looks. She's innocent, but her likeness to the witch expresses that she's a hair away from being corrupted and becoming a deadly seductress. When the witch awakens, she has to be kissed, which will bring her to her full power and kills by draining him of his life force. Which, after what we saw about body symbolist romantic femme fatale, will not surprise you. Succumbing to the witch's temptation signifies the loss of all that is cherished to men. The characterization of witches in movies is mostly a caricature, either a crone or a succubus, threatening with their thirst for independence and power. The good witches never seem to seek power and are more traditional in their depiction of femininity. However, in later movies, the characterization may becomes more sophisticated and so becomes the clothes of the witch. Up until now, witches in movies were often the villains and a second role, who were often defeated by what was perceived as good. Their clothes were meant to build their dark aura and they didn't get much character development that could have shown through their clothes. What's really interesting is that, as witches become characters on their own, they become more sophisticated, more complex, and they can't be separated into neat categories anymore. 
They all have their own flavor of magic, so we can't really talk about witch anymore, but witches. As someone who loves all the Italian films and who's probably gonna make a video about the fashion in Argento's movies, I got super interested by The Love Witch from 2016. This one plays into the seductive femme fatale aspect of the witch, since the story is that she keeps seeking love using magic to obtain it, but it never ends well. The old tale of red magic and its shortcomings. However, it's modern However, it's modern and depicts the witch with more nuance. The outfits are gorgeous, seductive and mystical, sophisticated and varied. We can see the very characteristic mix of figure-hugging aspect, mixed with wide sleeves, to give an aura of enchantment. Her hair is free, long and dark. She wears a plethora of jewelry that looks like heirlooms of great power. Again, an iteration of the femme fatale of captivating and deadly beauty. The craft? the 96 version, is a massive inspiration for modern witch girls. They are punky, crunch, gothy, all subcultures that are very attractive to the youth. Also, compared to the other movie I talked about, it is a massive difference in how the characters are portrayed. They are normal teenagers ex except with powers. Each character has its own style of flavor and people watching them can identify with one or the other depending on their personalities. The outfits are full of layers and various textures with many jewelries, and I can see many examples of Pinterest people recreating or being inspired heavily by these looks. They are witchy yet casual and completely adapt to the modern world. And I think it was so successful because so many young girls at that time got in contact with some form of witchcraft or spiritism. It's a modern tale that isn't a Disney movie, it's full of darkness and nuance like an old tale. Also honorable mention to Charmed and Practical Magic, because there are a few good looks that inspired people today, with their beauty or corset, their velvet and lace, their grunge and goth style mixed with bohemian elements. To some extent, witchy fashion has been absorbed by the fashion world and seen many times on the runway because it inspires designers as much as it inspires us, and also because capitalism has a tendency to absorb everything even if they are countercultural in nature. You can find many looks in many different eras that take on such inspirations. You will find lace, corsets, velvets, jewelries, embroideries, and illustrative elements. Basically, even the most feminine silhouette, there's an air of originess, a magnetizing splendor emanating from these looks. On the more approachable side of things, we have aesthetics such as New Goth, Pagan Goth, and Whimsy Goth. Styles like New Goth, which was really popular a few years ago, plays into that idea of the witch femme fatale. It's basically a more approachable version of a traditional goth style, and you can see why American Horror Story Coven was such a hit at that time. The only color allowed is black, silver jewelry, moons, moons, so many moons, pentagrams, fishnets, chokers, cats, large hats, lace, and transparent fabric. Pagan Gut was also an aesthetic that was popular a few years ago. This one is a lot more intense and you can't really half ass it. It's a commitment. Basically, the idea is to turn yourself into a forest or bog witch inspired by Celtic and Nordic imagery and very popular with those of pagan faith. This is the most cinematic of them all. It really embraces the earthiness of the witch. Not uncommon to see furs and horns. You will notice that the makeup is particularly important and that symbols are drawn onto the face and body. Now we have perhaps the most recent one, Whimsy Goth or Whimsy Gothic. It's clearly more colorful than the other two, yet the colors remain muted. It manages to be colorful without being as unhinged as the maximalist style. Layering, putting pieces together that might, might be clashing a bit, but gives off that free, creative vibe that is the primary goal. It's basically a mashup between gothic style influencing and bohemian, hippie ones with laid crochet and floral print, for example. You might spot astrological symbols such as moons, suns, stars, and zodiacal signs. The shoes are quite important because that's where you really show the edgy aspect of it, wearing platforms or chunky shoes, long skirt or dresses with a crop top or a sexy blouse, or a cozy cardigan. It's sort of connected to cottagecore, but it's a bit more sinister. As if the idealist people of the cottagecore movement of the 2020s had become a bit disillusioned and had decided to take the matter into their own hands and embrace the darker aspect of the universe. But to go back to which core, there's an important point to be made. When it comes to witch core, there are two important facets of the phenomenon. Some people who are pagan of witches might gravitate toward this aesthetic, 
So we can't really talk about that trend, it's more of a lifestyle and a deeper mean of self-expression. There's also the other side of things of people who are not witches but want to play with this aesthetic because it's fun. It's a form of escapism and as I've said in my previous video on Harajuku and maximalist cultures, it's something people sometimes feel they need to feel happy and fulfilled in their lives. And we live in such a complicated world that people must find their own path to happiness, even if it's through something as simple as clothes. Because which core is not just about clothes, it's about connecting yourself to your dream self, to reconnect with your childlike wonder, to allow yourself to dream of a world that is not as it seems. A world that has a mystic and strange beauty to it, so far away from the mindless daily grind. So it seems that which core, rather than being a singular style, is more of an umbrella term that encompasses all things that are dreamy and dark at the same time. One can be interested in witchcraft and be attracting to many different aesthetics depending on an inclination. Regardless, I think it's fascinating that it's showing up at a time like this. As an archetype, the witch is an echo from a time of a goddess of great power, a person who disregards the traditional roles in pursuit of her own achievements to carve a path for herself between the earth and the stars. In this sense, she is especially relevant to the postmodern era and perhaps the reason why we saw so many more positive depictions of witches since the late 20th century. It's a way of retaking control of your life to be the person you dream to be in the depth of your heart. But more than that, at a time when many people feel disconnected from the land they live on, be it because of our modern urban lifestyles or because they, like myself, have parents who come from somewhere else and were uprooted from their original culture, it offers a path of reconnection with nature and with the history that precedes us. It is the visible external layers of a societal movement in search of tradition and meaning of generations that feel lost between wars and plague. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Speaking, 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 speaking. Ouch. Um, what was I doing? There's a leaf. I'm gonna focus on the ladder because it brings the, th the theme of the witch. Of the witch, the witch, witch, burn the witch.